I would like to begin today by saying that we are on the ancestral homeland of the Nooksack uh, people. Whatcom County Library System libraries collectively are on the ancestral homeland of the Nooksack, Lummi, and other Coast Salish peoples. They have been its stewards since time immemorial, respecting the land, river, and ocean with the understanding that everything is connected, related, and alive. We acknowledge the elders and their collective and individual plights and achievements. We consider the legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together today. And we pursue ongoing action to build lasting relationships and grow together so that all may prosper. Um, today's program, uh, we've got George Adams and Joshua Olson here to talk about uh, language. Thank you both for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Joshua Olson, Quinsner, Clash and Clear, Quanich, Book Out. My name is Joshua Olson. Welcome here to the Everson Bookhouse. Um, Clea Sialkin. I've been learning Lechalism with George here um, for uh, since 2010. And uh, we'd like to welcome you all here, uh, beginning with our Nooksack welcome song. <coughs> Nooksack Welcome Song. It's a song that was um, preserved on an old recording that um, a kind lady went and listened to at the Smithsonian Museum and then brought the song back to us years ago. I don't know my, the exact specifics. Can you talk more on that? Yes. <laughs> And my health and quiet when I was quite clear, tears come away. He said, I was quite quiet. So I need to sit to Kaima I told them at law, Josh, clear I need in them. Quiet it's clear. Quiet it's clear. Oh, come here. Mook and chair tea is too loud. Mook, oh, come here. To lead the Kaima Chakayas. Nooksack. Always nooksack. Skahomish, say it is snap. Skahomish, say it is. Always nooksack. You allow tear to the wheel then, muk, net, net, uh, stay to you. Cut close is my yak, tear, snap. Nooksack, to lead the skahomish. See if can can snap. He's in the steel. He's in the steel. To lay. Clear. 
kun okumik tail tie stole it was a nini nam kolokwe no kolokwe to eat a snack to kayas a nini nam Kendall Creek so we're here to present after this welcome song brought out to share, to let you know that we're still here. It's also, you know, to, to go ahead and explain our endeavors as Josh pointed out how we started to bring back A lot of things fell in place as that song was just brought out. It was through the kindness of um, uh, Pauline Hilaire, through her work of her father, Chaitlak. He was a, a, a um, song keeper and she inherited that in later years. And she always said that that nooksack was here that song. And at that time, I brought it before the council to re reintroduce that song to our people here. The times they're using, sometimes they're not using the song. But we just know that this song was a gift that was re reintroduced just like what I'm about to say about Tlatsalism. Tlatsalism is the, the name, how you would name English is English, or Tlatsalism is Nuxak, Nuxaat dialect. There are many dialects in Coast Salish. There's, uh, there's a story I always tell a short one, when I lived up in Northwood, Northwood is where I grew up, where the casino is today, near that place was my grandma's uh, home where I grew up most of my life, uh, formative years, <clears throat> because my mother took ill from tuberculosis. She was gone for seven years the first time and then another three years following it afflicted her but I was fortunate on one hand to listen to my grandfather who spoke Khlami, the Kongayanangs, the, the Lummi dialect. Grandma spoke Helkamelem which was by this time the language is pretty much settled here but all in all, time progressed where Tlatsalism became less and less and less. And I asked Grandma, Tlatsalism, Grandma, I said, how was it, how was it, how come nobody speaks it? She says, uh, well, there's a few that does speak that dialect. She named them. Some of them spoke mixed dialect, Helkamelam, Tlatsalasam. Some of them spoke variety of uh, portions of it. But then came great helpers. I'm gonna name one of them Alan Richardson. Could you stand, Al? Him and another person who should be here, but he passed, Dr. Brent Galloway. The two people who were linguist anthropologists, i.e., um, Al was, uh, Alan was an um, anthropologist at Huatum Community College. And uh, Dr. Galloway 
was from uh, UVic, and then he transferred to, uh, I'm going to say it, FNU. That's, this, that was, that's the name of this? <laughs> FNU. First Nations University out of, uh, I believe, Saskatchewan. I don't know. Saskatchewan. But anyway, that was the inside joke for Dr. Galloway and I. He would come every year. We'd meet up with Alan. We, he was work, chipping away, chipping away, and you could see the event of this product here. Looks like place names. It's in the library. It's in the library, he says. It's probably on the shelf here, and it's in the system. Mm -hmm. You could order it, and it'll be delivered to your It's a paid announcement, you guys. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But this book tells a lot. It doesn't look like it's much, but when I asked Grandma, which language did I speak? She told me, learn just one, that's all. And I couldn't understand what she meant by that. Then I absorbed it through Chlomi Chasen. Then I started listening to other languages like Ksen Chasen, Kawut Chasen, Helk Amelum, Lesutsin, Nuklai Amutsin. All these dialects that are associated, affiliated to the coastal Salish. So that's where Grandma comes in and says, you learn one, you could learn them all. I was baffled, but I found out the truth. But anyway, back to this book. And Alan, and Brent off and on would get together whenever they, they'd take um, time off or we'd convene somewhere in the summertime mostly. And we would go over the, the list that Alan came up with, the elders that are here and that are also listed in this book. I know all these elders here. In fact, I, there's one page in the first page. The only few of them I didn't know. Um, Page five, there's Brent in the back. <laughs> there he is. But I knew all these people, they were my elders at that time. I said, those are my elders. Just a sidebar, I went to my nephew's funeral yesterday and I sat with a friend of mine. I looked around. I said, where are all the elders? He looks at me like this. <laughs> I'm looking, where's the elders? He looks at me again. You are one. <laughs> <laughs> no. Really? <laughs> just that little while ago, I knew these people here just like I, I could talk to them. Susan, Marie, um, Helen, Louisa George. You know Louisa George through the Lasutsi, right? There she is. She would be walking to the elders, every little elders day at uh, Deming. And I would be downstairs wait, when they come in, I said, uh, whatever dialect they spoke. And then she would come to Lasutsi, just, and she stops and look at me, Louisa. She was kind of gruff. Who are you? And he said, I know she knows who I was, but she said, Kwacha, who are you? And I didn't, I just thought she just spoke Lasutsi. It turned out the work that I do, a good portion of it is from her. Tlatsalasam, dialect. So there goes my, my premise. You learn one, you learn them all. Well, she knew one, and she, she knew Tlatsalism. She grew up at, around her. Syndic Jimmy spoke Helkamalem, but he also was the last remaining speaker, fluent speaker 
in 77, he passed. I know all these people. These people that came, and yet they, they made a effort. Every time they would come to lunch, Brent would be there with his, before uh, uh, cell phones, you guys. He had a, uh, a board that he would write down the words on the board. And he persisted. He would use the Nooksack elders, uh, Halkamalem, to help him with the Halkamalem. This is just the volume one. Halkamalem. Oh, the other book is just the same thickness. So his work was highly valued, not only for the Halkamalem speakers in Fraser River, upriver, Kutsalukuyuk area, but if you know anything about the map, contours, contours of the map, our dialect was overlapping. The Kutsalukuyuk River was at one time Tlaxalism speaking people. Then the Halkamalem kept coming in, kept coming in. Why, I don't know. <laughs> but my grandmother, she was born in Matsqui, but her grandfather, who sat, and her great and her great grandfather, Waiwux, was born in Kolakwe, the place I was telling you where I am from. Kindle Creek, Hatchery, that very state of Washington, Hatchery. How many know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. I go by there and I peel out to go in there. Talk to my old to my ancestors that owned two longhouses there. Grandma told me that story, how they had to go leave that village because of the of the um tzachten, the the chash from the smallpox. When it took out immense amount, just like what COVID did, you take that and double that. So there became a reconsolidation effort to shore up, so they condensed. My grandma's grandfather, Hussain, moved to a place called uh, Langley today. And he married the daughter of Chief Sumas. And so all these things become real today. Like a lot of people think that Nooksack is just Nooksack. That uh, Lummi is just Lummi. No, we were villagers. We had to go to different villages to survive, to maintain. Even before the sick, the, the, the epidemic, that was their way of life. Everyone has different villages. I have villages. He has different villages, but he's part of my village too. We all have that connection. That's how we su survived the many uh, different um, uh, confronting issues at the time, whether it be war or land takeover or whatever. We we had to work together, and where the where the resources were depleted, like this whole place was loaded with. Camas, how many know what camas is? You can't find one plant. It's gone. Not one plant. I I dug, I looked and looked. Where? I went south to uh, meet a friend in Kaulitz who wanted help in their language. And I looked. Fields. Uh, Spanan. That's our word for it, Spanan. They have it. I don't know how they 
allowed it to survive, but they have loads of it. But see, that was like, what do we consider today as like your, your main staple? Span and camas. So there was a lot of pressure on going to find place to eat, going to find place to gather, became shrunk. So where do we go? It wasn't until the late 1800s you start seeing people moving, migrating towards what now became farmers, planting hops, planting different uh, forms of food that my, 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 my grandma's era, she was born in 19, or 1898. They had to take a boat from Bellingham all the way down to um, Whitewater, Muckleshoot, Tulalip, and harvest hops. And it was all those things that was that would that was the um, the mainstay was to find places that would give a, give a, a way, means to survive. The area was getting shrunk. Places to fish were cut off. Places to hunt were cut off and gather. But today is different, much different. There's more conscience in, involved today of what's happening to this world. I'm just side, uh, uh, diver um, getting a little off the subject here, but our people had to survive So we had to go where the resources to survive. This place was pretty well migrated out. Um, down Pialp area, they were, they were all um, scattered. Nowadays, we, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, return to our homelands, our villages, and uh, there's still an attempt to revitalize the language. Some say, "Well, we'll just go with Helkamelum," which is this di dialect I was telling you about. Brent was working on my grandmother's first language. And I learned from growing up those 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 languages. Grandpa would speak Kulamit Chasen. Grandma would help me. I was a brat. I'd be laying in their bed, and I'd be wedged right in between them, like a brat. And I could hear them talking. What the heck are they saying? Then I'd catch a word here, and it's, uh, uh, they would say a phrase, uh, it's a white person, Grandpa would say. Then Grandma would say, Hulitum. how come Grandma says it this way? Ah, oh, that's Grandpa's language, and or, yeah, vice versa, I would talk to them. But that's what Grandma said, learn one, you'll learn the rest. So that's why I took this book, why is this book irrelevant? They could have, all these place names could have been Halkamalem or Klamichasen. No. Satsalasam. They said, no, we want it, Satsalasam. And so they made a concerted effort to, you know, Alan could have talked to this too of trying to re revert back to the traditional namings of these villages. Kwanich, Squahalich, Kolokwe, um, uh, all up and down the river you got villages. We even had saltwater uh, villages. 
a lot of them uh, were pre pre contact, but then they were absorbed by the uh, the Kongan dialects. But that doesn't mean that that wasn't our our traditional sites like Skalachen. There's stories about that. <coughs> Skalachen. There's stories about. We have a, a village right today, Matsqui, the reserve right across the border, where Grandma was born. There's a place called Muxen, means nose. The story of the Muxen from Chachalts, who was the one who walked the earth, the, the one who walked the earth that changed things. If they didn't do it right, they would change them into salt, or salt, rock. So these stories have importance to our, our history. Goes back before time in the memorial. That village is still there, but it's absorbed into the Matsque people on the other side of the boundary. So that tells you you know, we didn't, Nooksack didn't go right to that line. Say, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, can't go across. No. They were, they were going to go see their, their grandpa. They were going to go see their aunt. They're, they're going to see their kid who was married over there. They didn't stop there. That was a late advent. And today, it's still causing problems with our people. And anyway, I talk too much, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I wanted to get this out because the importance of the relevance of place names is to start with that branch. And so when I, after that was published, it was about the time I, I got a grant from the uh, United States um, to um, revi a language revitalization, a pilot program, first two years, and then the next two years um, implementation. And that's when we started with a cadre of, I believe, five, mm -hmm. five young people like Josh, this is, I think, 20, 2011? 2010. 2010. <clears throat> and when, uh, before that, 2003, um, Brent and Alan, you remember that ceremony by the, where the, where we had that uh, ceremony of bringing uh, all those written documents that helped generate a lot of these words and stuff that Brent gave it to the Nooksack. And from that time, <clears throat> I've been burrowing in it, living in it. Sometimes I wake up and I'm talking in it. That's, that's what it takes. Is who's here, my granddaughter's second grade teacher. I'd like to let, acknowledge her. Her at uh, Ferndale. These kids are the, are the, I'm going to say it kind of corny, but they're like a crop. <laughs> you got to nurture it and let it grow. Like my granddaughter, from uh, she wanted to go back to that school, even though Nooksack was a good school. She wanted to go back because they, uh, my daughter moved to Lummi, and so she had to go follow. And but she wanted to go, so she she wanted to go from here back to Skyline where. She was their, their teacher then. Left an indelible 
mark on her. And every day when I bring her to school, he'll send my oats. My oats need him, he's the tlatsalism, he'll send emits. But not to not, some at law. He's ten, he'll send I need him, some at law. Zoe, but not to not, some at law. He's lost the need to be the mooks. I'd always, every morning, get her ready, help her get ready, all the way to school. And I know it's hard, but it's worth it. Because when she spoke back to me in, in her language, I almost up my pants. <laughs> <laughs> up my pants. <laughs> uh, is our new word we learned. <laughs> <laughs> was at his house the other day, uh, two days ago. I said, what are we going to He's got, he's a caretaker of, uh, of a couple of extra dogs. A real, um, uh, the real active dogs. And then one leaves her up right on the floor. It's, oh, I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, your little dog is no good, leaves it. And then he has to go take care of it. So that was it. It was one of our words for today or that day. Uh, so you guys got a new word. <laughs> There's other forms of it too, but. <laughs> So that's what I, I say is that this is how you teach in context with him. <laughs> and that when we are on a canoe journey, I always on a canoe speaking in the language. Always on a landing speaking in the language. Always in the in the in the gatherings, the potlatch hosting in the language <clears throat> so that people could hear it, just like I showing you the return is here. Little by little, but it's here. And that's why we are here to, um, to share with you growing up. And then I want uh, Josh to explain a little bit how he got involved in the language and, how, and had a starting point and on and on how that affected him. I think uh, learning a new language is, you know, fascinating for a lot of people. It was especially for me growing up, you know, growing up only knowing English and hearing, you know, going out and about in the town and then hearing other people speak their native language, you know, Spanish or Mandarin or Chinese or whatever. And, um, you know, kind of feeling feeling a little bit of an emptiness, not knowing my own people's language, you know, and kind of knowing that history. Um, but uh, in 2010, I think I was, I was 19 at the time, and, you know, going to the education department at the Nooksack tribe uh, while George was still working there. And they said, there's a, pro a language program coming up, teaching people to learn the language so they can become teachers. Um, so I was able to get in on that, um, and it, that was that was a year after the first time going on the canoe journey when jo George was a skipper there too, and you know at the time it was like it was more of like a kind of like a fun little thing to do you know something to learn, and then over the years I learned how important knowing your language is especially for native people, it, it and I'm. Just more and more I'm realizing how much it solidifies and strengthens your connection to the land and how the language actually comes from the land. The names of different um, villages and the place names, um, which the place names book, I use that. That's pretty much my Bible in, in life and going about, um, you know, existing here in Whatcom County. Um, 
but the names they describe what's there, uh, Mokwam, um, that's the, the Indian here, Labrador tea. Um, you know, there's, there's a few different pl place names that carry that name. Nokholokwam, um, uh, uh, where Whatcom gets its name from, water, water with dog salmon in it, so that's where you want to go when you're trying to catch dog salmon. Um, but I, I really feel like it's an integral part to a tribe's sovereignty to be able to, you know, say that we're still here and we're still us. Um, but it's really, it's really taken a form in my life that kind of gives me motivation and pride and it's something to, you know, something to hang on to and kind of feel a little bit important about. I kind of get a big head sometimes, but it hum but knowing the language actually humbles me. <laughs> um, and yeah, over over the years, I've been able to work with George for the last thirteen years, off and on, um, kind of advancing my knowledge and learning how to converse in Tlachalism. And like he was saying earlier, knowing Tlachalism has helped me know learn uh, Tlachutzit as well. Um, it has a different kind of writing style, but whenever I hear a Holkamalem speaker or a Lashutzit speaker, I kind of get what they're saying without them having to translate. Um, I also want to mention too that the, the library, we're using the Nooksack Place Names book to uh, create some signage at all of the library locations where that correspond with those specific place names. Um, so at some point when you come here, you'll know the traditional name for the Everest scenario, which would, you know, it's Quanach. Um, yeah, and then uh, two, just last, early last year, uh, I learned about the Washington Humanities Grant. Um, it was a mas master apprenticeship program where they were providing some grant funding to people. Um, I think it was a thousand dollars for the apprentice and uh, four thousand up for the master. Um, so we've been able to use that program and be, be able to meet up and it really kind of catalyzed us to meet up every week to work more on um, practicing Tletchalism and using a master apprenticeship of language arts that was developed for in, the, in BC, I think the University of British Columbia. We're kind of using that framework and um, our material is what George was talking about, the, um, the work that Brent Galloway did and Alan Richardson with the Nooksack elders. Uh, decades ago. So the language, you know, by some standards, language is extinct, but really it's not. It's it's here, it's available. It's uh, it's just a sleeping language. Um, do we want to get into doing a lesson now? Yeah. Yeah? So just to short explain um, the methodology. As you see, uh, all these dog-eared texts in front of me, in front of you. Everywhere I'm asked to go, you know, to help them with their language, like in Nisqually, it was my last stop uh, last fall. And uh, of course, we, we all have our own little networks too, you know, like um, Dave knows that with uh, Tulalip and all these different tribes have their little language uh, programs. And so I worked with the Nisqually. Nisqually people are the Suits eat Southern. I always tease them, you know, because my grandmother is from Snohopes, Snohopes, Quid, Kaya, Tulit, Snohopes, Snohopes, Tzitzel, Bich, Ol. And I would use their language, but I would always say, well, Southern Lasuti has a little more twang to it. As Tlobil Chak, ooh. Hey, see, yob does ya ya. They don't say uh, they don't say spots. They say stutwood. 
I said, well, a hot. But I have fun teaching them too because they know, just like as Josh iterated, you got to make that language alive. You can't just be looking at itches on a paper. When we when we talk, okay, we got to go through the etches to get to that point, but then we try to, you know, um, bring it into their own. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a... Um, I'll show, um, first of all, basically this handbook is from uh, BC's Man Appren Apprentice Language Program which I shared with uh, Nesquali and I had, uh, we did a kind of like a workshop where we we actually did some uh, conversions from Pasta uh, in English to Squali uh, um, to the, the Nesquali dialect. And and it's just like what we're saying, what he was saying, is that it was energizing to to get an, another look at the, um, how to teach it. And this book here kind of lay, lays it out. This is just a photocopy of it, but it's basically thematic. You know, the thematic uh, approach where you you uh, talk about different things. Like um, the first place is uh, deals with Daily conversations, hello, goodbye, yada yada. But this, the second one, or the third one, is about about me. How is that important? It talks about my name is Selchen. Selchen Kunzna. My name is Selchen. So we go ahead and we just we, we translate the English here into our dialect. The second one is health and sickness. You can see where that comes in. COVID and all that stuff. I had to come up with the word for COVID. Tell me that ain't fun. <laughs> clothing, you know, shitsum, clothing. Uh, it was the next theme we would, Josh and I worked on. And then bedroom, La Alwis. Oh, we forgot the vanilla out. Uh, living room, doing laundry. Oh, I had fun with that one too. Bedroom, Alal was uh, out, and then we did kitchen. How many know what a kitchen looks like? So we, we'd use all these themes, and then uh, the one we're working on now is uh, the bathroom. How many needs the bathroom once in a while? So we're going to do that one, just we're going to do one, one little excerpt from it. It's page, um, forty. 42 uh, under the map book, but I corresponded. Everything I do is uh, is okay. This column here is uh, Satsalism. This column here is uh, past, past an Otsin. This column here is Tohot. Uh, Tohnomot is the, your, how you explain each word. So it's so all these words that are new per him or myself or whoever, these innovative words would, I would have to fabricate because there's, there's, um, there's things you have to do, a protocol, in, in to incorporate new words, innovative words, acculturated words. Let me use an example, glasses. We didn't have glasses. But what did we call them? You listen to my elders and you, you just they'd laugh. And Chakwan's Kala Alos. And Chakwan's Kala Alos. And they'd all bust out laughing. What, what did I say? 
What do you call eyes? Tell aloes is the, you remember the glasses that have this they look like the shape of a coin that back in the old days money eyes mm -hmm. that's the word we use for glasses tell mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can see why people are laugh where's my eyes at my money eyes <laughs> So some of those words are easy to transliterate. In other words, you, words you can't find a cognate with it. Well, transliteration becomes like like the word for um, George, for example, would be choch. The word for John would be chon. The word for Mary would be mali. These are transliterizations that were in, incorporated in. So uh, And French, the Chinook jargon became uh, the first, the first ones to do the Chinook Wawa. A lot of our dialects have Chinook Kashu, Le Cochon. Uh, that's pig. Uh, Le Plate, priest. Um, there's, so there's a number, of, a good portion of Chinook Wawa, and, and a lot of our dialects that I can go on and on about. So I have to go through and make sure that, that so when he gets this on his, when we're done with this, uh, this project, he'll have a starting kit for his kids. So this is what my goal is to, if we get done with this, we're about over half, a little bit, no, maybe a little bit half. And, um, uh, and then, then once he gets that into his uh, repertoire, he could use it between him and I. Then we could branch from there. You see what I mean? So you see, he'd be, he'd be, he'd have enough uh, background to, to, um, to be able to carry on conversation, as well as expand. Because I'm teaching him also how to do words that are not in. The, in the classified word list, in other words, a dictionary. So what do I do? I go hunting. Put on my hunting hat. Mm hmm. hmm. I wonder if my cousin's over here. Nuklayam. Nuklayam. Let's try and go. My cousins. She yeah yeah yeah. She yeah yeah yeah. I would get these guys. Look for their how they sit. Oh, yeah, that's what they mean, okay? So you have to be, um, be able to take all these other sources that are filling in the gaps. Like all these books are not all the books in the universe. You have to fill it in as you go. So that's what I'm teaching him as to how to go about consonant, vowel, consonant. That's all you need to know. Consonant, vowel, consonant, verb. Our language is that based, verb. You change it to a noun, an adjective, or whatever, and you have the, uh, the syntax, and you have all that word order, and you start learning all those patterns, and then pretty soon, he'll be able to do it on himself. I'm pretty sure he knows how to do some of it already. But the magic is consonant, vowel, consonant. This is Proto Salish, which is the compilation of Coast Salish and Interior Salish. And you look at every one of these entries, they're all consonant, vowel, consonant. Why? That's how our words are formed, even no matter what dialect. And so when, when I get stumped, I say, well, I wonder what. My ancestors, uh, my ancestors would say, I'd check it out. Constant, wild, constant. Um, and so you go about this process, and if you can't find it there, you got to find it in, uh, you might find it in our um, Skohomish. Skohomish. 
Squawks. Squawks is their name for their language. A lot of their words are similar to Tlatelism. And the same thing with Sanchazen is like Lummi. And of course, I know Lummi as a base knowledge, and I could just go. So, yeah, it's pain a painstaking. But well, we, we do it because we want it. When somebody looks at this, and they'll see that the ascertaining part is that the new introduced words is substantiated somewhere, whether it's Chinook. Chinook Wawa, or its derivation is, is similar to the uh, Tlalem, or it's similar to Husenjasen, or Helkmelem, or Kawachasen, Skohomish. You, you, you use them because they're our, our elders, they're our relatives. And that's what they did long ago. I mean, they, I mean sure, their languages are further apart. Are more un, less understandable than your neighbors. That's obvious. So, so we're going to just do a little um, sketch here for you. Um, Nanucho, you check Nanucho, Nanucho. Nacho, 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 Ilchen Nijim Said, Ilchas Ilchas Ilta as now she shall. Sure, it's down the hall. Quite so, quote, see, quit Ilta Nijim to well. Conversation to practice with little kids. Yes, to to a to to a to a shokum. It's time for your bath. Action now. Yes, oh shokum. Slap. Yeah. Bath time. And clear to clum. And clear to clum asum. Do you want bubbles? Yes, please, bubbles. Bubbles are fun. Clear to a stretch, 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 and took the air. I show them here your bath toys. I'm she the quite quite poop. Give me the red bolt. These are kids, right? <laughs> Maybe it's us, I don't know. Oh, that's how to and the Shot tones. Try not to splash around. He is shot quite shot tones. Splashing is fun. Clear to so. My oats chalk hack neat as quite 
Yokon Tok Hua Snuddle Nick Shen. Here's the soap. Remember to wash your toes. <laughs> oh, oh, sit tum, sit tum. That tickles. Yashna skli shokwamikin shok shokikinam. Yashna skli shokikinam. I need to wash your hair now. Oh, uh, called question. Her question. Quis I oh no when kolam. No, I don't like it. Don't get soap in my eyes. Oh, it's out. See, see, I mean. Each chan kom schlat som. My oats eat la tuk tuakholas. Don't worry, I'll be careful. Keep keep them closed. Each chan ahoy. I'm done. Yes, mal amin to tol ho chum ish chan kum hek on newts chow. Time to come out, then I'll dry you off. Ish chan to tsatsa kum amin to hek wilston. I want the blue towel. It's clum ish chak yash hayan to itot aloe ka ima yash latso. Okay, now get your pajamas on. It's time for bed. <laughs> so we go through that, and then we talk about the entomology between the different words. Um, and a, a lot of a, a lot of our learning time together is. Kind of what you've already seen already, uh, George talking and me listening. <laughs> um, but it, uh, and then in my notebook, I you know write down the little, whatever notes I have that talk about the entomology between the different words and how they're how they're made up. Like itot aluit, itot uh, is a word for sleeping. Aluit is clothes that you wear, so it's literal translation is sleeping clothes. Um, Yeah. <laughs> uh, what time are we at? We could take uh, some couple of questions here, and then we could we could resume. And take a break. Yes. When I look at the Nooksack um, grammar, or it, you know, it. It's in that um, language. I can't come any close to pronouncing. You know, it's the, it's linguists use that. How how on earth did you learn that in the first place? Well, uh, IPA, which is commonly referred to in linguistic uh, form, is uh, International Phonetic Alphabet, which is used. Most all linguists util utilizes that format to um, to uh, to write down uh, each cognate that they come up with, whether through transcribing or whatever. And and uh, Brent and his uh, and his style, he he learned from. Uh, um, which is called uh, um, practical orthography, which is a, a, a fancy way of saying the keyboard rather than font oriented. So you could just use uh, any keyboard, whether it's your your uh, cell phone or your keyboard and your laptop or whatever. So you don't have to look for um, a font all the time. And chances are somebody doesn't have the font to receive. So what we do is we utilize that format because it's readily available. And I, as an educator, I went through that that whole thing 
IPA, I was all IPA, IPA. I spent more time trying to teach the IPA than teaching the language. Sure, yeah. Let's do it, you know, practical. Why do they call it a practical orthography? Is it because it's IPA? No, because it's practical. So it might take two, two uh, alphabet letters to make a sound, which IPA does. It, one IPA sound is one uh, element. So like CH sound, which is in English, is a C with a little wedge on top. It's just one symbol. But practical orthography, you use CH just like you do in English. So you could you could it bypass a lot of teaching upside down e. My elder was teaching. Why do you have to ruin my language with an upside down e? A <laughs> schwa. <laughs> so we just use the e right side up. No big deal. Just so that there's consistency in every every entry. You don't alter it. However, in Catholicism, I found out that there are elements in the vowels. For example, U, the letter U is, is pretty much a Lesotic form, is O. But it, uh, it oscillates back and forth, depending on preference. So U and O. U and O. U, O. So, so what I've done is they made the, the decision that the alamor for U is O. So if you if you if you see someone saying it like like the word for going home, tok is tok, 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 going home. But since it has tok, like we have tok, but we say tok, tok, tok chen, going home. So, the way you'd write it out is K W with apostrophe is K, and a T with apostrophe is T, K, glottalized T, or it's, uh, how do the linguists call it, uh, something T anyway, Sh sharp T I call it. <laughs> so you, you just learn that system and it's, no matter what system you use, as long as you're consistent. But I always try to train for convenience. Like when I do a workshop with uh, people in La Suzy, I say, okay, but you guys got to go along with me. If I use practical orthography, it's because of convenience. You should be able to be versatile. Shouldn't be a, uh, oh my God, <laughs> we're going to perish. <laughs> Yeah. Um, part of why I came to this is because I've been, I started the journey of studying uh, Irish, so another language that's been like drastically affected by colonization. Um, and seeing you talk about, or hearing you talk about it, um, like being on the forefront of like, creating new words and like a language that's very much like, in flux, um, it really resonates with, with what I've been learning and about. For example, like people in Ireland creating non-gender binary or gender non-binary pronouns, um, which is like sort of the bare minimum that you can do nowadays, but seriously contrast to a language like English, which is, in my experience is like really resistant to change, um, and it's been pretty much the same my whole life. And I'm really interested in what your perspectives are, like individually um, learning a language more from your perspective and like teaching a language and kind of being on the forefront of of creating new words in that language and like how that compares to like English for example. Um, like I feel like you have a lot of freedom to some degree with like creating new words and like bringing this language up to date for lack of a better term and you are also learning a language that isn't fully like fleshed out yet in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in like what your perspective are on that. Well, in uh, Eastern uh, United States on the seaboard over there, the people, the First Nations over there are Mashpee. 
Their language was zeroed. What, what saved them, what prompted them to, to reach back and try to revitalize their language, which was minimal at best, and then when they, when they got a hold of a, a Bible that's been translated in Mashpee, they took that form and they used that and they learned the syntax from that and they learned uh, the uh, pronunciation of uh, the phonemes of each word and then they and then they started reestablishing a conversation they're going to have you know obviously religious words in there but but that's what they did and they're, they're teaching their kids today so you know the the hunger is there for everyone to re reinstall or re revert back the language no matter what and so uh, i i i applaud you for for doing that you know it's it's it's, it's frustrating yes no doubt sometimes i just say well i'm going to take a break then I end up thinking, oh, I gotta find this word now. And I get you get bothered again. I call it get bothered. So I I find it a mission. And I always call it, uh, you know, put the words on you want to work on, on on a, an abeyance, and then go ahead. But then when you get a chance, do the diligence, the due diligence of. What would it be like? You check your cousins. Clallam, Sanit, Chuchalakwiok, Skagit, Lasutsi. You see what they, how they say, they utilize that. If you know their sound system, if you know their sound system is like it's predictable, you could translate it and then you could say, oh, that's that word. Like the word for splash. Shoot. Shoot is to splash. Shoot. Well, it shoot. You remember I said the, the allomorph of oo is o. So that would be the, 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 the cue of whatever. And in, in Lummi, it's shut. So it's the uh, the schwa. Shot, shot, shut. Splash. You see? You decoded. You could work for CIA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Just wondering what your thoughts are with AI being used to try to, uh, the way it just scours through all the stuff available on the internet and how it takes those documents. What's your thoughts on that being used to recover languages or to develop separate ways of teaching the language? I'm quite, I'm quite excited. But I'm also cautious about it because, you know, we struggle so hard to keep the language, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden it, it's not utilized in a good way. You know what I mean? Because um, there might be somebody that wants to say, well, I'm going to create the Lasutsi dialect and go ahead with it. But there's got to be input. Of course, the old saying, input in equals in, uh, input out, or uh, what is it, going out. But the algorithms is fascinating because that's basically what I do, and I, would, I could imagine how much work that would save. Uh, so I see a valid argument, but it's still uh, in its formative stages that I'm, a, I'm, I'm keeping my eye open, and I'm being a... Uh, uh, open 
but I'm, you know, I would have to have my reserve uh, some kind of caution in there to make it in stages. Now, if it's done in st strategically in in a format that that brings it together rather than just you know somebody come in and start downloading on uh, social media or whatever without any uh, uh, coordination. That would be that would be wrong. Yeah, AI sounds really promising. Uh, you know, as a tool that can help us really bring it back and really help to revitalize it. But in learning this, I wouldn't be able to uh, actually speak these words without George's, you know, personal one-on-one -on -one guidance. Um, yeah, it's just it's just so different from English with the uh, different consonants, uh, silent consonants, I guess, uh, some of them. Um, but it sounds, it sounds like a really great idea, in my opinion, to incorporate AI into revitalizing languages. And I, I just wonder, too, about cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. And I know the Maori people have real concerns about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, uh, I know there are leaps and bounds in bringing their language back. Same thing with the Kanaka. Their people are bringing it back. And, and it, I admire their, back in the day, you know, when, they, when I first, I want to go to Hawaii, you know. Uh, seriously, I want to go to Hawaii. Everybody says, yeah, right. I want to go to Hawaii, you know, because they were forerunners of the, how to bring the language back, you know, and, uh, and language immersion and all those other things that that they've done ahead of the curve, you know. So I I give them kudos for doing that, you know. As long as they have the you know the the final say, that's the only thing I would say. This is academically way above my brain power. But I noticed that when people come to my father's nursing home, and he's 88, and they speak, he understands, even though he didn't really speak much as a child. He spoke in English all these decades. If we had tapes where we could play them for our children, and they heard it in utero, they heard it when they were nursing, even if we don't speak very well, if we had songs and they just listened to it for hours a day and that's what was on in their mouth, would that help so that when they come to someone like you, they've got some sounds and some things to draw upon from their baby language? Is that what an ordinary people who just struggle with one language could, could do for our grandchildren? Is there a way for us to, to do that? I would say shortly. Uh, when we started out, you know, we took the, before the book was published, by the way, we, we just about this time it was being published, but Josh and the, the, my whole cadre of uh, uh, intern, teacher interns, we'd go to the actual place of the village that we're, we're learning. And we would offer our traditional ways to to bring that, that name there to ask the ancestors that were from there, that are probably our ancestors, you know, and we don't know for the most part. You have to connect in that way to, uh, I know it sounds crazy, but it's like, you have to prepare yourself in a good way for your, your kids, your grandkids, you know, and, and not be afraid to use uh, the medicines around you to, to help facilitate, facilitate the, uh, what you're trying to achieve. You know, that is part of you, part of you. And so that's what makes what he is, is ascribing to as um, it makes him want to, to go on. Like the song we sang, which we'll close with a song here in a minute. 
But it's those doing those uh, due diligence things that, you know, when you talk, if you create that environment where, like my grandma, I always invoke my grandmother. I'm not afraid to admit that. She would help me in her way. In some way I will be, you know, oh, that's what you got to do. So it's not it's, it's it's that kind of thing, you know. It's not all academia, you know, where you have to everything's got to be written down. You know, I do it for a purpose. But the real teaching is when you like when we talk. That's when it becomes real. And then when you teach, like my granddaughter, you know, I I speak it to her. He said, "Oh, to ask school, to ask well, he said, 'Come oyem.'" Let's get ready to go to school. We're, we're late. So I have to say, Katlasisma kwa as a kwanokta hukali, the school school kali, halakta tzik tzik. Get on the truck. She knows what I'm saying. He might, you know, once in a while, she'll bounce back with the words in our language, but most of the, all of the time, she understands what I'm saying. But that's how you keep keep it out there, keep it alive. Okay, I think we got. I just wanted to say too that is this reminds me of a conversation I was having with um, an elder in North Dakota. Uh, he was a he was a Lakota medicine man, um, Leonard Crowdog, and one thing that he was really clear to me about was that the it's the idea of the language that's important. And it, when it comes to things like, you know, cultural appropriation or, or these made, you know, made up words for things that we have today that we didn't have back then, um, you know, like uh, George said, seek, seek uh, for truck. Um, you know, it's really the idea of the language that's important, not necessarily how correct you, it is or incorrect it is, it's just, as long as you have that that strong idea of how important the language is to be. That's the thing to really keep in mind. Um, and uh, it's our Nooksack farewell song. Like everything, you know, when you have the, the, the mind of bringing things back, you know, you, the songs are waking up just like the language. The songs are coming home. And the songs that I was gifted is through the traditional way. So this song is uh, Hoi Mass. Hoi Mass means farewell, or in that in that vein. But then Stiti Iuk, my people. So this is the uh, the last part. But I just wanted to share the song so that you will kind of know that when we say goodbye. Thank you.
last word I want to pitch in for Billy Franks Jr. yesterday's um, birthday. You could see the connection tissue between all the peoples. You go to um, Western, the Indian Street used to be. Guess what it's called now? He's one of our heroes, fighters, warrior, thrown in jail. 91 or 90 some plus times in jail. <laughs> he like, he brings that out and I says, 90 times? Oh my God. Just to, to fight for the fish, the fishing rights. Henceforth, you know, the, uh, the people became waking up to the treaty rights. That's where he is to me and to my fellow cohorts that he is yesterday, is his birthday, so we honor that day. And uh, I hope to have a little doings. They, have a, they had a doings at the, uh, the, the casino in um, Lummi, but I didn't get a chance. It was a funeral I had to attend, my nephew, but I just wanted to bring that out, and I'm sorry. George Adams, Joshua Olson, uh, thank you for your gift of being here with us today. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> Joshua Olson is a Nooksack cultural liaison who works with us uh, primarily at the Deming Library. And so if you'd uh, like to continue a conversation with Joshua, um, many times you can find him there at the Deming Library. Um, we would appreciate any feedback or comments you have about today's program. And we have these fancy little QR codes. And so if you have your phones or your devices, um, we've got these codes at the table that may still have a few cookies on it. Um, thank you for being here today.